Uh, good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Uh, agenda item one uh, is on NHS governance. Um, could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are uh, on silent? It's, uh, of course, acceptable to use mobiles for social media, but please do not photograph or record proceedings. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a declaration of interests in accordance with Section 3 of the Code of Conduct. I invite Sandra White to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee. Uh, nothing to declare. Uh, thank you very much, Sandra, and welcome, you're very welcome to the committee. Um, NHS governance is the second item, uh, and it's a roundtable evidence session uh, on clinical governance. Uh, we've received apologies from uh, Dr Brian Robson, Medical Director, Health Improvement Scotland, who was due to give evidence this morning. Um, I will introduce myself, then if we can have people uh, go around the table and introduce themselves. So Neil Finlay, MSP for Lodians, and I chair the Health and Sport Committee. Ash Denham, <coughs> MSP, and I'm the Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, Nick Fluck, I'm Medical Director for NHS Grampian. I'm Miles Briggs, I'm Conservative MSP for Lothian and Conservative Spokesman for Health and Sport. I'm Tracy Gillis, I'm the Medical Director for NHS Lothian. I'm Alex Cole Hamilton, Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Western. I'm also the Lib Dem Health Spokesperson. Uh, Chris McIntosh, Medical Director for South Lanarkshire Health and Social Care Partnership. Uh, Jenny Goldruth, MSP for the Mid Fife and Glen Northus constituency. Morning, I'm Jason Leach, I'm the National Clinical Director. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emma Harper, I'm MSP for South Scotland Region. Robbie Pearson, Chief Executive at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. Uh, Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. Rosemary Agnew, Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. Uh, Brian Little, uh, Conservative MSP, South of Scotland, Sportsman, Health, Education, Lifestyle and Sport. Uh, Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin. I'm Sheena Morrison. <coughs> I'm Head of Public Protection and Quality Assurance for the Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership. Uh, I'm uh, <coughs> Colin Smith, MSP for the South of Scotland and Labour Spokesperson on Public Health and Social Care. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have got a lot of people around this table this morning, so um, brief uh, contributions would be really helpful, and we'll try and cover as much as possible in the, the time we've got allocated. Um, and if you want to um, contribute, if you just indicate to me, and some of us here will hopefully catch your eye, okay? Um, Emma, would you like to begin? Thank you, convener. Good morning again, everybody. Um, Last week, I was, uh, it was my first week attending, but the evidence that we took was that there are standards and guidelines that do exist and that the patient groups generally think they're good. So I'm curious about how do we implement the guidelines? How do we feed it down to the shop floor level? How do we make sure that you know, the patient delivering the care actually deliver the guidelines that are recommended? Who would like to begin? Robbie. I may, convener, just put on a bit of context around this. So, Health Improvement Scotland has a, a pivotal role in terms of supporting the uh, production of those guidelines and standards. So, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network has around 50 guidelines currently um, out there, and um, in terms of standards, there are around 15 as well. So, what is Healthcare Improvement Scotland seeking to do? What it's trying to do is to put a framework, the tools, the means for good practice, the best evidence. To be shared and one of the, the key roles for Healthcare Improvement Scotland is the dissemination of those guidelines and, and standards. So one of the things that is important is to think about how best we implement them and there's not a single answer to that. That requires um, the use of digital technology for instance in terms of dissemination of those guidelines and standards but it's also important that we provide the environment for staff working in the health service to use those guidelines on a day-to-day Basis. Now, one of the key challenges, I guess, in a world of more complex care, uh, more patients presenting with comorbidities, is how do we make sure those guidelines are tailored to individual needs? And I think that's an important part of the discussion, perhaps, uh, this morning, about how we make sure those guidelines are relevant and can be implemented in day-to-day -day practice. OK. Uh, Rosemary? Yeah, I just want to follow on from that. Um, as Ombudsman, we have a very specific focus on this, and that is we handle complaints. Very often this involves where guidelines are not adhered to or not met. And one of the things that strikes me about this is um, it's not just about implementing. There are two other very crucial things, and one is when they are in place, it's about ensuring that if they're not adhered to, there is effective learning from them. 
Um, but the other, and I feel very strongly about this actually, is that staff are actually given the support. If something goes wrong, they're given the support to understand why, that the organisation embeds that learning culture and that the soft skills as well as the clinical skills are also there for both clinicians and non-clinicians. So for example, we see quite frequently the issue is record keeping or communication. And it's not that people go into work to do these badly, but there just aren't always the facilities or the support there. And for me, the governance mechanisms have to actually embrace this and embed it to understand why, if standards aren't met, was that the case? What was the root cause? Because it isn't necessarily human error. It might be the systems that surround them actually enable something to happen that shouldn't have happened. So I, I think in terms of the standards, getting them in place is important, disseminating them is important, but once they're there, we have to continually monitor and learn if they don't deliver the outcomes that we expect. Okay, Jason? It's a crucial question about how you implement best practice guidelines around the world in health and social care. And Scotland has 55 guidelines just in sign. Each of the Royal Colleges have guidelines. NICE has 297 guidelines. It's, it's almost impossible to keep up with the guidelines in your own specialty, never mind the guidelines that are generic and everywhere else. So therefore, relying on sending guidelines to clinicians is clearly not going to be the final answer. It's part of the answer, but it can't be the final answer. So you have to, inside the system, make it easy for the guideline to be followed, whatever that guideline might be. It might be hand washing. It might be putting a cannula in the back of the hand in a certain way, five steps, whatever it is. And, and Scotland has an enviable reputation for applying improvement science techniques inside the delivery of those guidelines. It's not perfect, but people come from all over the world to see how we have implemented elements of those guidelines. So now, when I trained, 100% of people got a needle put in the back of their hand when they arrived in hospital. Now, about 60% get a needle put in the back of their hand because we know 40% of our healthcare acquired infections are from that needle. So we now don't do it in people who don't need it. We've implemented that by applying methods inside the system, not by sending everybody a letter to tell them how to do it. We require the evidence, which Robbie's organisation finds, writes up, publishes. But then inside the boards and inside the wards and the GP practices, they then implement it inside that system. And the Scottish Patient Safety Programme is our neatest, you would expect me to say that, our neatest example of how we implement those guidelines. Okay, Tracy. Organisational view about how when signed published guidelines we uh, take those in so we have a process for all newly published guidelines to look at them. The guidelines come with recommendations which are graded by their quality of evidence and so we make an assessment of our own system involving the local clinicians about are we delivering care that's to that standard or not and where we're not then we put in place an action plan to say how will we address that. But I think there's an important point that's been raised about how do we contextualise that for the patient who's in front of us as a clinician and how do we discuss with them what options there may be the evidence may say one thing but their particular context circumstances preferences and beliefs may wish them to um, uh, have a, a different uh, care provided in a different way and so I think that's an end part of the process that we need to remember is very important and the part that I think Rosemary's picked up that we need to get better at is if we don't provide care according to some of those standards we need to remember to explain in the notes why that is so somebody else can come and see afterwards why that was. <coughs> the guidelines are you know are to be followed for implementing best practice for patient care. Last week Dr Benny talked about some of the guidelines being single um, specific condition only so but we've got patients coming in now with multiple like mm -hmm. diseases and processes so should the guidelines take cognizance of that? Should we be rewriting guidelines and looking at comorbidities in the guidelines, which is, <laughs> might be complicated? Uh, yeah, Christopher? Um, it's a very good question. I, I come from a general practice background, and the majority of patients that we see within general practice have more than one long-term condition. And at times, the guidelines for one are, um, to a certain extent, fighting against guidelines for another. Um, and 
you know, one, one could give examples. And some of that comes from the fact that the evidence behind it comes from you know, good quality evidence and sign um, and his and so on are very good at rating evidence, but really good quality evidence tends to come from single disease processes for all kinds of uh, research re reasons. The other bit about guidelines is they are not, um, th this separation between a protocol and a guideline I think is important. A protocol is something which has to happen and the guideline should cover 90, 95%. Um, and I, I think what one is uh, using clinicians for is to actually use their experience and learning to make best use of the guideline, but not to be an automaton. Okay, Nick. Yeah, I think, I think just to build on that, I mean, it's clearly a very complex landscape. And I think there's a risk of us actually multiplying ever more increasingly guidelines to try to address that issue about individual circumstances. And I think actually the, the argument is, is counterintuitive and we should be heading back more into a direction of simplification. Because as I mentioned, we, we've talked about um, organisations implementing guidelines on their responsibility and, and much as Tracy says, our organisation takes that approach. But we've also got to consider the professionals in the system. <coughs> So the professionals are really have the accountability to sit down with patients and plan what the right treatment is for the individual. And that combination of high level guideline plus individual clinician discussion is what generates good care. And I think we need to caution against generating guidelines which are hugely detailed, ever expanding and work in tandem together with our professional bodies. Sandra's own guidelines and standards, yes, yeah. Th uh, th Thank you very much, convener. Uh, I was just going to ask a question which uh, Mr Flick had, had already mentioned about how complex it was because of different, you know, ideas coming forward. And what I wanted to ask the question was, how do you monitor, how do you monitor the guidelines are being used properly so that there's less complaints going to the ombudsman uh, if they're being used properly? And who is responsible for this? Is it multiple agencies? Or is there one responsibility there? Or would it be better if there was? I just open it up to that. Uh, Jason, yeah. So it's not, a, it's not a neat single answer, I'm afraid. The, Nick, Nick, is, Nick is right that at an individual level, it's up to the clinical team and the patient to decide on the treatment with all of the knowledge they can possibly gather about what that might be. So you might have a, a, a gentleman who's diabetic, who's got depression and has a very complex family history and kids to look after. That, there isn't a guideline for that. There are elements of guidelines that will tell you how to look after his diabetes, how to look after his depression. There won't be a guideline about how he looks after his children. But, but to try and make that intellectual decision, with usually with a general practitioner, actually, initially, it is quite complex. Now, if something is obvious, let's, let's say you have an operation Everybody knows now that you should have the surgical checklist completed prior to the operation. You should know who the patient is, which part of the body we're operating on, the x-rays up the right way around, and everybody's had their drugs correctly. That's a guideline from all kinds of authorities implemented by the boards. So Tracy Gillis, as the medical director, has responsibility for implementing that inside NHS Lothian. The surgical teams have responsibility for it. So if somebody doesn't have that done and then has an error, that would be a board challenge. So the board would then look into why that hadn't happened. More nationally, Robbie's organisation would go in and check the numbers of people who are having surgical checklists, the number of people who are following the diabetes drug protocol. That, so Robbie's organisation and its scrutiny arm would then inspect at a more national level implementation of guidelines that are appropriate to implement nationally. So three levels, individual clinicians, boards and Healthcare Improvement Scotland. I just wanted to add a, a point to um, your comment about s simplification. By the time complaints reach me and my organisation, the, the guidelines become standards against which you're assessing, and we assess on the grounds of reasonableness. And I think there is a, a strong argument to simplify and also make clear that the conversation that goes with the guideline is as important as the guideline. Because as soon as something says 90 to 95 percent, 
if it's not 100%, then often patients can feel that they've not been given the treatment they should have had. Their expectations are very high. So I think I just wanted to add that point about um, simplification, I think, is, is a good idea. But also, um, we do need to... Uh, really emphasise the importance of the conversation at the individual and the board and the patient level. Sandra, do you want back in? Just, just you know, a small, a small uh, coming back in that particular one. <clears throat> Simplification, yes, absolutely. I think we need to look at that. But from what everyone's saying, it would seem a long way off to get simplification on guidelines so that the people do, you know, adhere to it because every everyone's different as you said there's guidelines for x y and z and you can't put x y and z together so are you really saying that it would be impossible to get to that stage i'm saying you should standardize what you can standardize and individualize everything else so there are some things we have decided as a health and social care system that are no longer acceptable it's no longer acceptable not to wash your hands before you do an operation it used to be that you didn't do that decades ago it, in more modern times, we've decided that it's unacceptable to put lines into people's necks in intensive care without full barrier protection. We, that's a guideline. That's a standard. That's now not done anywhere in Scotland. It's now almost impossible to find anybody who has an infection from a line in their neck. That wasn't true 10 years ago. So there are some things we have standardised, and that will continue to be true. It may be there's new evidence which comes out next year that says this is what you should do about people with kidney injury this is what you should do with people with dementia however underneath that there are people individuals families carers complexity houses all the other public health elements which make up somebody's health and well-being that's almost impossible to standardize and you, sh you shouldn't which is why general practitioners healthcare professionals physios in houses have conversations every day about what would be best for you what is it we can do for you? And that may be, in some cases, off guideline. It may be that in a conversation with an elderly lady in her house who, if strictly speaking, the guideline says she should do this, she says, you know what? I, I don't, I don't want to do that because I'm 85. I've lived in this house all my life. And, I don't, I, and that's an individual healthcare team conversation with a patient or a carer. And that, that's individualization around the standardization which we've made across most things. Uh, Christopher? Yeah, I'm, I'm to well, with Jason, but that wasn't what I was going to say. He's doing the general practice line superbly. Um, I, I wanted just to br bring attention to um, West Scotland Cancer Network reports, because I think they illustrate very well how um, a guideline gets translated into some uh, real work, which is then looked at um, and checked on an annual basis. So West of Scotland uh, Regional Network for Cancer, specific cancers, here are the things that, that we should be measuring. The measurement uh, changes. It is a professional-led group. You see improvements year on year, and you see improvements on outcome year on year. So that is taking standards, but it is this um, quite specific area of, of, of single disease work. But it's very impressive, and if you, you know, it, it's worthwhile picking up one of them and having a look through and seeing how standards get converted in evidence and professional regulation into good outcomes. Hey, Rob, hey, Robbie. Uh, thank you. Okay, just to add a bit about what Jason referred to in terms of context. So if there are 17 million GP consultations a year in Scotland, then each one has to have a, a context and be individualised for, for the, the patient in front of that particular general practitioner. But f it's important also to separate out guidelines and standards. So Healthcare Improvement Scotland has inspected um, and produced reports for the care of older people over the past five years. We've produced 64 reports telling the story in terms of improvements in standards of care, but also where there is a need for further improvement. And similarly, in respect of the healthcare environment inspectorate, where we've produced around 270 reports, and the number of requirements and recommendations has fallen consistently year on year, along with the reduction in infection. So MRAC rates, for instance, have fallen by 90%. So it's important to put in context about what we should do and must do in terms of standards, but also contextualise it for the individual patient. Yeah, Bruce, thank you very much for checking in. Thank you for them. the contribution so far. It was specifically on that point that, that Jason made I wanted to follow up on. Um, things that clearly you must do, like wash your hands, and things like you might consider guidelines, which are here's some background on how you might want to approach this particular. Uh, is it clear in the, the, the way these are documented what the difference is? 
Or, or is everything called guidelines and it's got all of that stuff kind of thrown in the one? It's a good question. We're dealing with a human system. There's 160,000 staff if, just, in, just with NHS payslips. If you add social care into there, we're, in, we're well over 200,000 people who are interacting today while we're in here with families and carers around the country. So, so to naively, as some countries would suggest you do, send everybody a list of must-dos or send a, it, it, it just doesn't work. So what, what we do is, inside a, a, a framework of improvement for the health and social care system, we say, inside the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, these are the things which we say now need to be done. We, we called them the 10 essentials. So the central line infection bundle, the surgical checklist every time you have an operation. So, so we make those decisions after a period of time where it's embedded, where we know people are doing it, where it's working, where we have evidence. And then we have other things which are still slightly more innovative. So the acute kidney injury bundle just now, about people who are in hospital who have kidney injury who are not in renal units, who might be in surgical units. So we're implementing that more gradually over the whole country. Eventually, if that works and outcomes improve, we will make that one of our essentials. So there, there's a kind of scale of evidence and implementation according to where we are on that, on that journey. It, it would be lovely if it were neat and healthcare were, you could just take off the wall the evidence of how to treat dementia or the evidence of how to look after a, 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 a guy with diabetes and whatever. I, it, it's not quite as neat as that. And that becomes most apparent if you spend the day in a general practice where the undifferentiated unwell arrive in, that, in those rooms with with all kinds of diseases, where there isn't a guideline for the undifferentiated unwell on the wall. Uh, Nick? Yeah. Just to build on that, I mean, I, I think at the extremes, it's pretty clear to most people uh, about the absolute must-dos and some of the things that are guidelines. I think it's the territory in the middle that's a bit more confusing. Um, and it's interesting picking up on Rosemary's points because I, th I think for some professional groups and clinicians uh, there is sometimes an anxiety around the generation of guidelines that um, something does move into the territory of you must do this because guidelines <coughs> says it. Um, and, and definitely we've got quite a lot of material sitting in that hinterland which is really genuinely a guideline to help guide clinical management and conversations. But the individual interpretation of that may be that this is something I have to do, and if I don't do it, I will be found that I've done something wrong. So I think it's, it's absolutely the case we should recognise there is that anxiety for professionals in the middle ground. At the extremes that Jason describes, absolutely clear, and that's a good example of simplification of the system, saying, look, these top ten things are things that we absolutely have to do. That works well. At the bottom end, where you get into specialties which produce great volumes of, of information about their area, it's quite clear that's guideline material. Okay, Ivan. Yeah, just, just very briefly. So I, I hear exactly what you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense. So, uh, uh, is there is there a requirement for some more clarity around about that then to say these are the things that you have to do, and these are the things that are if there is that grey area in the middle? You know, why why are some things monitored very closely and other things left apparently? Uh, well, well, I mean, I. I I think they're two separate questions, actually. The, um, the clarity question is an interesting one, and I guess if you look at, if you go to one of the regulators to the GMC, you'll see they're very careful about the way they use words, um, and they're absolutely clear about musts and shoulds. Um, and I guess in legislation we have that around mandatory and statutory. Um, so I guess some careful use of language and a lot of education around that might help in some of those extremes. But I think it is, it is tricky in that middle ground where you've got so many different sort of um, bodies generating information and guidelines to get that degree of consistency where if we say should, that's actually something that must never not happen, if you see what I mean. Emma, you wanted back in. Some of the standards, procedures and guidelines can be translated down into Learn Pro modules or e-learning modules. Some of them can take five minutes to do and some of them can take an hour or even longer. So. I'm aware that uh, you know some of the education is even delivered in one minute outside the dining room on a high travelled pathway for staff. So you can do essential information like one minute scrub for the central line or, or whatever you need to do. So 
are, are we able to make the guidelines and, and what's required must do, nice to know, need to know, in a way that is more accessible for the frontline staff? I, I was a GP until recently, and just speaking about the kind of accessibility, um, a, a sign guideline comes as a big book and a smaller book and a leaflet. So the, 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 um, th there is a real effort made to ensure that as far as possible, um, the, the um, main points and the main structure gets uh, dealt with um, in a way which is accessible to staff. So absolute credit to sign um, in terms of being able to do what you describe. Um, having said that, some of those very small bits still become quite large because something <coughs> like management of type 2 diabetes it, it requires a lot of thinking and a lot of business going in uh, behind it. And the other bit, I think, which, which um, again, from a, a general practice point of view, uh, we've talked about the uh, morass of guidelines that are available. If you look at the kind of diseases that come through, you know, there's a big bunch of, of circulatory disease, there's a big bunch of respiratory disease, there's a big bunch of cancers, but it still leaves a big bunch of um, very rare diseases. And whilst one might have a command across most of the first collection, um, very rare diseases, even recognising that a disease is in existence and requires to move on to um, a secondary or tertiary centre can be difficult. And I picked up a patient opinion uh, last week which said, you know, there's a guideline about this rare disease. Why doesn't my GP know? Um, it, it's, a, it's a good question, but it's illustrated by the fact that you're one of a huge range of rare diseases. Okay. Jason? The basic answer is yes, of course. If, if, it, if it can be summarised into something neat and tidy, then NHS Education for Scotland are the organisation which will translate that into an educational product. And we do that around cleanliness champions, we do it around dementia champions. If it is standardisable in that form, we have an organisation who will do that. And then inside the boards and the institutions, the practices, the hospitals, then they would then do that. So we run... To pharmacy awareness days or hand washing days or whatever whatever the implementation might be and and then at some level that's supervised and monitored by those by those individual boards so if it can be summarized and not everything can of course you can you can do it in that educational environment the other point is the individual clinical team's responsibility for doing their best for every individual that they meet. And that might mean, in the case where this is a rare disease I've never seen before, I'm absolutely certain somebody will have said something about this somewhere and telling the patient, this is a very rare disease, I'm going to go find out. I'm going to, and that's okay to, to say, I, I don't fully understand this process, but we're going to come back. Okay, um, Nick. Yeah. It's just ready to build on that thing about rare diseases because I think that's a really important point. Rare diseases are actually quite common. Um, so rare diseases are classified as um, a frequency um, great, uh, lower than 1 in 5,000, and we've got a great big manual full, full of them. But about 8% of the population have got a rare disease. So whilst individually they are very uncommon and that signposting is critical, they actually represent quite a bit of stuff that comes in front of general practitioners or other clinicians. On the rare diseases as the chair of the rare diseases implementation strategy oversight group which is a bit of a mouthful <laughs> but it really is thinking about how in scotland how are we implementing the strategy that's out at a uk-wide level around caring for people with rare diseases and there are a huge number and it's a very very fast changing field so actually the way for uh, patients families to receive the best information and signposting to the right type of care would not be for individual professionals to try and carry that information in their heads it would be to have a level of awareness and access to good resources to know where to go to get the most up-to-date information and how to be able to get professional to professional support about the best diagnostic path or the best support mechanism to then be able to discuss that with the patient and their family. So have we got the right systems in place to do all of that? So we do have <coughs> access to good systems, uh, yes, and we have a lot of collaboration going on and participation in the right professional networks. Alex? 
Thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thanks very much for coming to see us today. Um, I'd like to move the discussion on, if I may, to a discussion about um, service redesign quality and the tension that that creates for patient groups and, and in particular communities in geographically remote locations. Um, I'd like to start by specifically addressing the issue, and I think that, Jason Leach, if I could ask you first and foremost, there is, I know, a formula around a certain number of uh, surgical procedures that people need to um, to undertake in order to retain their, uh, their ticket, as it were, um, and that obviously then leads to service redesign if a surgeon is just not getting that... Um, that daily exposure to, to perform those surgical interventions, um, then they're relocated to somewhere where the demand is greater and that they can, can meet that. Um, who, uh, who calibrates that, um, first and foremost, and how is that done? How, how do you come up with that number, and who determines um, when somebody falls below that, that they're going to lose, well, they're going to lose their edge, as it were? So for clarity, I no longer meet the number of surgical uh, procedures required, so that's why I no longer operate. Uh, the, the Royal Colleges of Surgery, so there are three, four if you include Dublin, so Glasgow, Edinburgh, London and Dublin, they, they are the hosts for that surgical standard, if we're talking about surgery. But it also applies in medicine, it applies across other specialties in general practice and other places. But it's neatest in surgery, as you, as you illustrate. It's unusual for there to be an actual number. It's true in some places. So, for instance, knee revisions. If you have a second artificial knee placed, that's quite a difficult procedure, very complex, and there, are, there is a number. It says, I can't remember what the number is. Tracy might remember. I think it's 15 a year or something. You have to do of knee revisions because that's hugely complex. You're only going to need a knee revision once, probably, in your life, maybe twice. But it'd be unusual to have three knees in your life. I don't mean three knees. I mean three <laughs> consecutive knees on the one knee. So, so you make a decision as a health system, whether you're Danish or Scottish or Swedish, that knee revisions will be done in the knee revision expert centre. And our knee revision expert centres are in the Golden Jubilee and in Lothian. And you're going to have to travel for your knee revision. So at that end, it's probably reasonable. When you go and ask the public what, what happens about knee revisions or cleft lip and palate, maybe we don't want to talk about cleft lip and palate too much, but again, 100 babies a year born with a cleft lip and palate, it's pretty clear we're not going to do that in five centres. It's pretty clear we're going to do that in a very small set of units. Diabetes, hugely common, hundreds of thousands of people, we're going to have to do that everywhere. So there isn't any choice. GPs are going to have to see diabetics. We're not going to suddenly say... You can't go to your general practitioner if you're diabetic. You have to go to the Golden Jubilee. So the two extremes are okay. Every healthcare system in the world is struggling with where the line is in that continuum, particularly those with rural challenges like Scotland. So if you're in Inverness, at some level, we're going to have to continue to provide most surgical specialties inside that centre. But there are decisions to be made around trauma, around cardiothoracic surgery, around neurosurgery, where the numbers are not tiny, but they're not big enough to manage huge centres because you just wouldn't get enough care. You wouldn't get enough cases if you stay in Rig more for, for the major trauma that you would require to have the skills. And there are both numbers and competencies about how you might do that. So the fundamental answer to your question is the Royal Colleges decide and can inspect and can look at what our surgical levels are. We then give advice to the ministers about how we should then distribute that care around the nation, taking in it, the views of the public, the views of the clinical teams, the views of the local elected officials at every level inside those environments. But at some level, somebody has to make a decision about what's going to be provided in NHS Grampian, NHS Highland. And that, that won't always be everything. OK. If I may convene it, um, you touched on two particular issues there, the cleft palate surgery, obviously close to the heart of everyone who represents constituencies in the Lothians, because we've now lost our, our unit there um, because of the service redesign, and also the rurality. And uh, I think we'd all accept that, you know, that that's one of the negative consequences of that system. Um, 
is, I mean, how is this reviewed? And uh, it, does it take account of, um, you know, the, the views of patients in these areas? The, the fact that we may have an absolutely white hot physician who is practicing, but maybe just doesn't get the, you know, a few shy of the 50 or whatever they need to perform. How, how much, fle much flexibility is there in that? So nobody's making a decision on on somebody who's just shy of the 50. That 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 it's much much more complex than that. I promise you. And it's it's the support teams, it's the staffing around them, it's the other services that we sh which we can provide around neonatal intensive care or whatever the system might be. It's also where that expertise might live. So we moved cardio extensive departments of cardiothoracic surgery into a single unit in the Golden Jubilee because. Combining that expertise makes the on-call much more efficient. It makes the research base better. It it's just better for everybody. The decisions are made fundamentally on it. The advice is given, let me correct. The advice is given based on the quality of the service provided. That, even at an official level, even at, when I give advice about what we have to do with a service, is based not only on the quality of the clinical care, but also on the patients and the families and the carers who are in that environment. And we do our best, both at local board level and nationally, to listen to that conversation. And then there is advice given to the ministers of the day about what we believe should happen inside that service. Most of those decisions are made without any controversy at all. Most of those decisions are, are uh, non-controversial. The public are engaged, everybody agrees, and, and we move on to that service redesign. The ones that reach the level where you get them or you make a case for them, they, they're the, they the edge. They're often at that edge. And then we have to make a country decision about how we're going to deal with that. The, and it doesn't, it doesn't always come from the basis of you can't provide that because it's rural. Dumfries and Galloway has doctors who are employed by Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So they might be getting the core of their work in the Queen Elizabeth and travelling to Dumfries and Galloway or Stranraer to do outreach clinics, to do other work. Lothian has examples where they have surgeons who go to Grampian, where they have surgeons who go to Fife, who are, who are maintaining their clinical expertise and their senior group of clinicians together in Lothian or Glasgow, where the bulk of the work is. And then they go on the road. I used to do the clinic in Oban. When I was a head and neck surgeon, I would do my main work in the west of Scotland. And then some young guy had to always go to Oban once a month. So I got it. So I loved it. I went on a Thursday and a Friday once a month and I did surgery in a clinic in Oban. They couldn't have a, a head and neck surgeon, an oral surgeon in Oban. They didn't have enough work. But I would go from my clinical base in the West to Oban to do the work. Thank you. And final question, and, and by all means, let me open this up to the, the wider room, but maybe you want to come in first, Jason, on this. Is that is the, um, the changing landscape of the NHS um, will that necessitate a review of how we do this? Because and I'll give you an example of that. Um, I was visited by a constituent who is happy for me to name and Dr. Patrick Statham, at the, who's a neurosurgeon at the Western General, who was very concerned about the fact that they, he and his colleagues were persistently having to cancel elective neurosurgical operations because of bed blocking in the wider hospital. They had no inpatient beds to receive them. Um, and that, as we know, is a, a, an escalating problem. Um, way off okay. what we're supposed to be on here. So you maybe want to speak to Jason at the right, end. Right, I will do. No, no, that's um, fair. Because we want to get on to accountability, so I yeah. shall bring you in now. Thank you, <coughs> Convener. Um, we've had a number of previous evidence sessions. I'm, no doubt our witnesses will be aware of that. And some concerns were raised with the committee around about the idea of accountability of NHS boards. So I'll just run through a couple of them. So one of them was variations of treatment and care between the boards. Another one was that complaints are dealt with by the boards themselves. And the other one was about serious adverse effects also being dealt with with the boards and um, the, with witnesses saying that they weren't reported to either to HIS or to the Scottish Government at that point. So my question to the panel, I'd be interested in your views on this. Do you think that NHS boards are sufficiently held to account for what they deliver? Who would like to come in? Uh, Rosemary. Um, it would be remiss of me not to say something about complaints, really, wouldn't it? Um, I, I think it's worth recognising that in the past few years there's been a significant change in the approach to complaint handling. And part of my role is the Complaint Standards Authority. So 
by the first of from first of April 2017, NHS boards were part of the sector that had a model complaints handling process that saw significant changes. So there is now two stages. You try and resolve it. You look at it in more detail. And if the person who complained remains unhappy, they come to the ombudsman. Now, what's significant about that is for some NHS boards, this changed their approach from being up to seven stages into something that was much more simplified. The systems in place, what we now have, I think, as a challenge is to make it work as well as it possibly can work. And that's why I think the role of my office is so important, because what we will pick up is where there is inconsistency in complaint handling. Um, and it's, it's part of our uh, strategy, part of our aim, that there has to be learning from complaints. Complaints have to be valued, and we monitor um, how this happens. Now, I don't think we've reached a perfect place. I think we're on a journey collectively in Scotland. But to change something now, I think, would undo a lot of good work that has been done. What I would like to see is, is more education for complainers to get better consistency of how boards actually carry out their complaints handling. And we do this through a variety of ways. Um, for example, my, my staff attend a, a network meeting of complaint handlers. But there is still, for me, a gap in this, and that is at the corporate governance level. It's very difficult, I think, to separate out clinical and corporate governance here, because what we don't always see, and I have to say this is my observations based on seven and a bit months, is I still don't see the right level of connect between clinical and corporate functions, if you like. So we see it in responses to us where there is clearly a corporate explanation for a response to a complaint, but I'm not always convinced that there has been the right level of clinical input into that. And if it's true for us, then I suspect it is also true when boards and um, organisations are responding to complaints. So what I would like to see, and which my organisation will continue working away at, is to try and shift the culture so that it's more about learning and valuing as part of that wider framework, not just of itself, but also to embed it into governance systems so that rather than simply monitoring numbers and how many we upheld, how many we didn't, um, boards, uh, particularly in governance terms, play a much more active role in the more qualitative things about views about the quality of care, the standard of care, how both both parties felt about it, so that what we have is a better understanding of why we're getting the outcomes we want and need, or why we're not getting those outcomes. And yes, it can link to standards, as we discussed before, but ultimately I think this is about a different approach to how we use the information um, through organisations like his as well. So, yep, we're on a journey. We've got, I think, a good system in place, but we need really still to embed it more at a, a governance and a cultural level. Okay, Tracy. So, so really just to build on that point, I, I think it's helpful to think of a complaint as a patient experience adverse event, because that's really what it is. So if we, if we take adverse events, I think there's something very important that as a system, we need to own and understand them. They're, when we look at adverse events now, they're... They're not about, as Rosemary said earlier, they're not about pointing the finger or blaming an individual. They're about understanding what's happened and what do we need to put in place to make sure that doesn't happen again. And that needs to be uh, done by people who are working within that system. I think the risk, if it's done entirely from outside, then there's not an ownership to actually change that system and embed that into everyday practice. And I, I understand the point about the... the 
the interwovenness of corporate and clinical accountability. And I think that's about how open you are as a, as a whole system to trying to learn when things aren't going according to plan. So we meet every fortnight as a group of executives, not just the clinical members of the team, but the non-clinical ones as well, to talk about significant adverse events and what we've learned from those, to talk about serious complaints or difficult cases we have in our system. And that's led to a much greater focus around the board table in what's happening in our system and what do we need to change. I think that's something you said there, quite telling that you, you want to call it a patient experience advert event, but I bet you most people just want to call it a complaint. Um, so, you know, this to me is, that's, I have to say, I think that's an indication of where there's a gulf between the people who are making the complaint, i.e. the patient, and the board and others who want to call it something else, who want to pretend it's something else. Sorry, sorry, maybe I should have been clearer. I'm not trying to pretend anything. Really, I'm trying to say that when a complaint happens, for that individual and their family, things have not gone according to plan. And that's why we would think that. We're, we're not trying to call them anything other than complaints. That's what we call them. Okay. It's, it's, maybe I didn't explain it clearly. OK, I, Sheena, and then I'll come back, Ash. I just, I suppose, wanted to reinforce some of the points that Rosemary was making and the importance of that uh, expectation within an organisational culture of openness, valuing learning, um, and, in, and basically that continuous improvement loop that, it, that reinforces the need for, uh, for that learning and to recognise, and I think the discussion already this, this morning has, has emphasised the complexity of the health and social care world and the interplay of of, uh, of, of so many different elements that come to um, uh, uh, come to fruition to some extent when somebody either makes a complaint or there is indeed a significant uh, adverse event. Um, and, and I suppose from an IJB, Health and Social Care Partnership point of view, uh, the point I want to sort of uh, re reinforce again is the need to recognise that, that we are talking about individuals who have not just got uh, complex medical circumstances in terms of comorbidity of a whole range of medical requirements, but their social circumstances obviously pay, play a, a major part in that and in their health and well-being. And the interplay of health and social care services in the resolution of, of a number of both those health and well, well-being issues as well as uh, the resolution of a, of a, of a complaint or a significant uh, adverse event being uh, considered. Um, I think that the importance of um, learning and, and valuing that learning and that openness is one that certainly within uh, the IJB that I uh, 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 report to is one we've been really reinforcing because it's the only way, it seems to me, that you actually re reaffirm that need for accountability. Whatever the processes are, whatever the governance arrangements are, the actual ability of the organisation to recognise when something has gone wrong and to then admit that, accept that and move on is, um, I think, the, uh, the, the value of, uh, of the, the, cult, the inherent culture in that organisation. Brian, is it on accountability? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Katrina. Good morning, panel. I think um, I'm interested in, in adverse events and what constitutes an adverse event uh, and is that consistently applied across uh, all health boards? And whose responsibility is it then to review the levels of adverse events and what happens if there's major changes in numbers of adverse events within a health board? Robbie. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. In terms of Healthcare Improvement Scotland, um, we've created a, a national framework in terms of um, what an adverse event looks like, what the processes are, and the categorisation of adverse events from permanent harm through to um, uh, potential to cause harm, um, and near miss, for instance. Um, and what we've done in that framework is seek to put in place the building blocks to allow local NHS boards to move to a system of openness, of learning, as opposed to a system which, frankly, can look like defensiveness and evasion. So that is an important part of putting in place the, the, the building blocks. So going back to the point about accountability, there is a very clear line of accountability from NHS board chief executives to the director general of the health service, the chief executive of the NHS, ultimately to the cabinet secretary and into this parliament. So the accountability system in some ways in Scotland is simpler than south of the border. 
But we in Healthcare Improvement Scotland have got a role in terms of the improvement support, the tools, the helping to build that open culture, and also in terms of subsequent external assurance and scrutiny. So one of the key points for Healthcare Improvement Scotland is about our powers or our independence. I think those are pretty clear. What is important for us is we have that system of follow-up and ensuring that progress has been made. Okay, um, Christopher. Yep, and thank you. Um, following on at a, at a board level, the um, NHS board through our Healthcare Quality and Improvement Committee um, monitors the numbers of significant adverse events, and there is a timeline for responding and getting um, investigation, and where we are in the investigation of each of those gets monitored and then the board is interested in the outcome of each one and what action we have taken and, and following through. So there's a clear line of accountability. Okay, Nick. Yeah, yeah, I think the issue of accountability is, is, is pretty laid out and very straightforward. I think the question went back to this idea about the degree to which boards should internally handle things versus how they should involve people outside. And, and again, um, I, I think there's a, you know, a lot, lot that can be done around that. But again, I think we sometimes fall into the trap of sort of language. You described it yourself, is that we talk about um, you know, different processes we go through and regulatory organisations will also describe them in different ways. The third party that's critical and I think is where we're trying to move forward on is how we involve the people who are actually involved in the complaint or the issue itself. And I think that's when you really sort of make some difference in terms of giving um, accountability some tangible be benefit to people. So you're quite right, people for people it's a complaint, but there's nothing better than having that direct dialogue with someone to say, what is it um, for you, rather than saying that we're trying to categorise this as, you know, our complaints system still has sort of language such as whether a complaint is upheld or not. Well. Uh, the business isn't trying to decide whether someone's complaining or not. They've written a letter, they're complaining. So it's about understanding. So I think uh, some of the stuff around duty of candor will probably help. Um, I think increasingly involving patients right at an early phase in resolution or involvement in investigation will also help. And I think there is a balance between internal and external investigation as well. Hey, Tracy? Just going to add in to um, one of the things that we've started trying to incorporate into our adverse events process is to actually ask the family uh, or the individual what questions would they like to see answered as part of that uh, investigation, and it, it makes for a far more powerful uh, investigation. Okay, I'm still on accountability. Brian, you got a follow-up in this? Please, I could. Um, what I'm hearing there is that accountability stops at board level. Um, I asked a specific question is who is counting the number of adverse events happening within individual boards and what happens if that number changes, which we know is a huge disparity across uh, the health boards at the moment. Um, and I didn't, I didn't get an answer from that, uh, Mr Pearson. Oh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Can I pick up that point? So I think there is an issue about consistency of reporting, also the quality of the reporting and also the quality of the investigations. The thing, though, I would caution against is creating a, a counting system alone. The important point is about the learning. So the experience in England, when they created a national reporting system, was it created a very large database. That database in itself does not lead to learning. So how do we actually create a system, picking up the points, uh, for instance, by the, the Ombudsman about there's a genuine system of openness and learning. Duty of candour will be part of that, but it's also a cultural shift that is required. I'm still not getting my question answered here. If there's a huge change within adverse event review reporting within a health board, who's counting that and what, and what then happens after that? Who, who's, who's watching that? Because all I'm hearing just now is that a board is responsible for their own adverse events and I completely understand that what we're trying to do here is, is create an environment where of openness and learning. But if, if you're leaving it to the board themselves and nobody, like it, and we know HIS Scotland, are not responsible for counting adverse events or, or, or monitoring adverse events numbers within uh, health boards, if there's a huge change in that, surely that must instigate some kind of reaction. So what we see in terms of um, the system, the system is, in terms of the numbers, is only part of it. So if we see changes in patterns of um, incidents or concerns, then there's an issue there for the individual board. Also, there's an, in the context of their clinical governance. But we have a broader role in Healthcare Improvement Scotland in terms of that external assurance of the systems and external assurance in terms of the quality of care. 
So that's all part of the role. But what I would really caution the committee against is a system which we are we're counting something on an indicator. What we want to be doing is actually trying to create a culture of openness and transparency, which is frankly some of the issues that we've discovered in our recent reviews. So in terms of Ayrshire and Arne, it was about um, failures to follow um, protocols and fetal monitoring. Um, there was a lack of involvement of the families and the, the quality of the RBS event review itself was poor. So what we're trying to do is to build a system which takes us away from defensiveness to openness, and I think that will be all part of the, the approach which Health Improvement Scotland is seeking to embed. But this is a cultural shift. Yeah, I, think, I think we'll try to find is that who knows the numbers, though, and that's a critical thing. Maybe Jason can help us on that. You're not, you're, I'm not going to give you a neat answer, which is, I, I presume you can predict that. There are some reportable events that the government get knowledge of. So we know how many infections there are. We know how many stillbirths there are. We know how many, it, very, very unusually, but how many people have an instrument left in after surgery. So there are very, very unusual and rare events that we know a number for. And if that number changes dramatically, infection is the neatest example. Even now, because infection is so unusual, even a very small number of infection gets activity. So we would contact the board, we would ask them what they were doing about that ward with C. diff or E. coli or whatever, and we would react. And that reaction would be principally to check their monitoring was adequate. If they needed external help for that, we would, we would do that. If we felt that system of older people's care was failing in some other way, we would contact Healthcare Improvement Scotland and we would uh, ask them to scrutinise that service. The addition of adverse events into a table is, no, is not going to help us because the definitions are so broad and so varied that individual clinicians are making those judgments. We have to rely on the boards to have processes in place around clinical quality committees, morbidity and mortality meetings that happen regularly so the clinicians will talk about the adverse events that happened, talk about the failures, talk about the good cases that happened in there. We, we seek knowledge from the... Uh, Complaints and adverse events are unusual. Let's keep it in context. Millions and millions of transactions every week, and it's still unusual to have a complaint or an adverse event. We have systems in place for learning from both of those elements. A few years ago, we decided we didn't know enough about feedback. We, didn't, we knew the complaints and we knew the adverse events, but we didn't know what the vast majority of people were experiencing. So we decided to use Care Opinion. So Care Opinion now has 9,500 stories where it's positive, negative, mixed who come back with stories that the system then learn. You, the MSPs in this room get reports from, from Care Opinion if you've signed up for it. If you haven't, you should. And you get an understanding of, of what's happening in, inside the system. The boards, and even below the boards, inside the local systems, so if you're a GP practice, if you're a surgical environment... Focus on yep. adverse events and, and the consistency and inconsistency of reporting on that. I think that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of here. So an, you, if you seek a national reporting system for adverse events, I think it's the wrong answer. Most countries who have it have abandoned it, and most countries who still have it just have a big database of counting. Yeah, it's actually not what I'm asking here. What I'm, what I'm getting to here is that if there's a huge change in the number of adverse events reported within a health board, that to me indicates that there's, or could indicate that the bar is being set at a different level for whatever reason. Who monitors that? I'm not saying, I'm not saying the Scottish government monitors that through performance management frameworks, where we would monitor their board papers, we would monitor their governance committee papers. We would know if that happened. Well, then in that case, what 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 then protocols are put in place to change that? Because that is not uh, my experience at all. And when I asked that specific question in an HIS review, I was told nobody monitors the numbers of, of, of adverse events within any health board. Well, you asked a broader question than that. You didn't ask just who monitors the individual numbers. We, we monitor the government. We have a performance management infrastructure that meets with boards on a regular basis, that monitors the board papers, that sees the minutes, that sees the data, along with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, who are involved in improvement science, improvement organisations inside those boards, and the scrutiny. So between us... If such a thing happened that you'd describe, we, we would know. Be helpful here, and bear in mind time. I think the committee should probably write to you to clarify the, the situation and maybe get some more information on you on that. Is that, is that helpful? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I've got Jenny, uh, Jenny, then Alison. Thank you, convener, and good morning to, to everybody who's here today. Um, just a specific point, uh, Dr McIntosh, with regard to your submission. Um, you mentioned that evidence about safety and effectiveness comes through the DTEX incident management system. Um, and last week um, at our evidence session, we heard from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine who flagged problems with the DTEX system. Uh, they said that it hindered rather than helped and that it was a barrier to changing a culture of resistance to learning from mistakes on the NHS. Would you agree with that? Um. I think that, thank you. I mean, I, I think there are questions about how it is used in different boards, mm -hmm. um, and the the there is there is something about culture. Um, it I think it's probably accurate to say that it has been at times um, a barrier, and some of that will have been in terms of just how easy is it to use it. So there's kind of IT solutions, IT access, um, but and and some of it then is what is the response. Again, it picks up on this idea about are we using complaints as a measure and a monitor which does something about saying you haven't performed well, bad person, um, or are you actually using it as a learning experience, which is uh, what we are tending to do within Lanarkshire um, increasingly, and that gets a better response. There are a lot of things that go into Datex which actually never really see the light of day, and that they're, they're not of... of of huge benefit, but there are huge numbers of things which come in, tend to show us patterns, uh, tend to allow us to make changes before they actually reach the level of requiring significant complaints, um, adverse event reviews and so on. And that huge area where um, we, we haven't actually got to a significant event, we may not even have got to a near miss, but things could have been done better, mm -hmm. is it can be improved and, and we're tending to that gets picked up in datix. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's not perfect. Uh, Nick? Yeah, I think, I think there's something about expectation here. It, it's a relational database. It's better to have something where we record what happens than not to have something where we record what happens. The question is how you make it um, improve its utility for individuals and how you make it bespoke for different purposes. So I think that just requires an ongoing bit of work within each of the boards. So we've done lots in terms of customising it for different settings, making it easier for people to put stuff in. So you can just go into a front page on the intranet and within one screen enter something that's happened in your area and assign it to one of your line managers to have that looked at. So I think there's a huge amount we can do to improve it. I, I've heard over the years lots said against all sorts of IT systems. I haven't met anyone who's loved an IT system when it's first arrived. Um, and I think we should just accept that recording stuff is a really good thing to do. Um, and then we have to do a pile of work around the culture and the processes and the behaviours about how we use that information to learn from it. I uh, watched the evidence last week, convener, and I was, this was the bit that surprised me. I, I was quite surprised by Dr Chung's evidence, and I intend to make contact with Dr Chung and see how we can help. I also asked some other boards about Datex. Datex is just a company. Datex just happens to be the one we, we use mostly in the country. Uh, I, and most of the feedback I got was not the same as Dr Chung's. It was a much more nuanced approach that Nick describes. Frontline teams adapting it for their own use, front, front pages where they could enter it very quickly, morbidity and mortality meetings where they were using the data and the knowledge very well. Grampian was a particularly good example that, that Nick describes. Lothian had some particularly good examples for me this week about how they have adapted it for use. There's a Datex users group so there is a national thing that comes together to share best practice amongst Datex users so we get better at it as a, as a whole country. And I'll, I'll make sure Ayrshire and Arden, uh, are involved in that and see if we can, particularly the ED, which he described, we can see if we can make that better. In conversations with staff, it comes up very, very regularly, um, certainly in the... It does with me too. Yes. Not in a positive way. <laughs> I have to say that, um, from my experience, people come to surgeries or, or people I know. Robbie? Yeah, just to echo the points, that um, Datex is a system um, that allows information to be imported. What's really important is we take the learning from that system and how do we ensure that it's embedded in day-to-day -day practice. And that's the key thing. So there must be a feedback loop. So there's an incident then the, the feedback, and then the learning. Now, I think that's the key bit in terms of what we're trying to introduce in Scotland in an adverse event framework. And that um, is not just important for staff, it's important to give meaning to patients 
who wish to share in that learning as well. And I think that's a, a crucial part of what we're seeking to do here. And when we're trying to bring together adverse events, complaints management, we've already touched on that, and duty of candour. So together we need to see them in the round. Still on accountability, Alison? Yeah, well, on these issues, um, witnesses last week spoke of the lack of that feedback loop. And I think Dr Benny said, uh, reported that there's a culture of learned helplessness in the NHS because staff see no point in passing on bad news as they don't think anything will happen. Um, I think the SPSO in, in the written submission really highlights the importance of learning from these events, but also I think has concerns that that doesn't always happen. And if we're looking at learning, we keep hearing about a need to change the culture, but I think the witnesses last week maybe suggested that it's difficult to change a culture where resources and capacity are, you know, really, really stretched. And, and David Chung last week in his evidence, you know, he, he, he said he, you know, he felt really uncomfortable that a doctor, as a doctor, he had protected CPD, but the, the nurses, for example, who are responsible for delivering so much healthcare in Scotland don't have that you know, same automatic entitlement to that time, that they're having to come in on their days off. And I'd just like to, you know, ask, you know, why aren't the bodies here insisting that, that all medical, that all professionals who are working in healthcare have access to CPD? Because if we're expecting, you know, people working in this environment to take on all of these guidelines and standards and deliver them, I think it's really difficult. The, the RCN employment survey found that 37% of members in Scotland reported not receiving any CPD in the last 12 months. You know, if they have to keep up to date with, uh, you know, how to insert various, you know, how, how to carry out various practices, how how can this be sufficient? Mary, you want to do yeah, Just thinking about this word accountability, we're taking quite a sort of process governance approach to it. But actually, we're accountable collectively to many people in many different ways. And the, the issue about Datex and, you know, staff say we put lots of things in. I hear lots of talk about learning. I hear lots of talk about improvement. But actually, what we also have to see, and this is important to users of our services, is something has to change as a result of it. Um, if we constantly ask for information, constantly ask for feedback, constantly say we're learning from complaints and nothing actually happens, all that will happen is it will undermine credibility and trust. So I think, coming back to points that, that you've made here about, it's also about how we have um, that feedback in a different way at frontline level, at the conversation about how the care is delivered. And it's the danger is we become too focused on the numbers and the um, reports and the governance and we lose sight of actually accountability is also about experience and how people feel about their, their uh, health care and their health provision. And that's where we have to make better use of all the information we gather. The other point I would just add um, is in relation to his as well. The... We're one of a number of, of organisations who provide information to the HIS intelligence group. And one of the things that I see as an obstacle for my organisation is our ability to be able to share the information that we have. We have very rich information, but um, in, under no illusions, it's in a very small, um, if you like, sphere because it is specifically about those complaints that reach the ombudsman and what we find a challenge very often is that we can't share some of the information that we think would help and help develop services so that's an area that I'd, I'd really strongly um, urge to, to be looked at is how we can share information so it is not just within boards but it is across boards and across Scotland too. Sheena. A quick point on Datex, just again in the context of integrated governance arrangements. Um, uh, Datex uh, within uh, the Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership provides a huge amount of, of information and rich data. Um, the accessibility of that information and the ability of other social care staff, for example, to input to the system is, is, is more limited. Um, and as we begin to progress and uh, obviously hope to improve uh, uh, a range of uh, governance and accountability 
accountability processes. That's one one aspect. The other quick the other quick point was really again on the feedback loop um, and recognising that the, the the importance of having the structures in place that allow uh, for reflection on um, a whole range of uh, of activity, but particularly at adverse events or significant clinical incidents, significant case reviews, and having that built in a dissemination process built in is really important and again ensures that staff feel more involved in the the the, the uh, developments that that come from uh, the learning from uh, such events okay. um, nobody's um, answered Alison's question about CPD and people's learning and their opportunities for that we'll make sure that is answered before you we leave Alison okay but I want to keep it on this accountability thing first okay Ash you, you want to come back in yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the accountability more in terms, I suppose, of of this idea of high level oversight, you know, maybe above the boards. We had some evidence last week that seemed to be suggesting, and I'll be happy for this to be contradicted if that's the case, that there wasn't an awful lot or there wasn't a process necessarily for sharing good practice between boards. So I suppose I would ask, you know, if there's a board, you know, over here and it's got really good processes leading to excellent outcomes, and then perhaps there's a board over here which is maybe perhaps struggling in that area. Um, from reading the um, written submission from HIS, it seems to be more of a collaborative approach that you take with boards in order to kind of work on improvements. Is there any ability to compel? Should there be a, an ability to compel boards to share best practice? Who would like to go first? Robbie? I think the point is that in terms of building commitment and building the will, then compliance has some limitations in doing that. Yeah. So um, one of the things that uh, we have just published in Healthcare Improvement Scotland is our impact report, which sets out a range of excellent examples of improvements in the quality of health services in Scotland. So we know there's been a 72% reduction in ventilator-associated pneumonia. We've had a 8.5% reduction in hospital standardised mortality. And in that report, which I'll happily share with the committee, is, and it's a public report, is it gives lots of good examples. And many of the examples come from colleagues who are here today around the table. So I would really caution about um, something about a letter that comes out to implement. This is a much more nuanced approach. If I can, though, just say something about uh, more broadly about sharing intelligence um, and good practice by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. So it's touched on earlier by the Ombudsman about sharing intelligence. So we responded directly to Mid Staffordshire in Scotland by assembling the key individual organisations who had the intelligence in Scotland. So one of the failures of Mid Staffordshire was a failure to share, a failure of regulators to act and to act on intelligence. So we now meet with Audit Scotland. We have the intelligence from the Ombudsman. We have uh, NHS Education for Scotland, who gives a, an overview of the quality, for instance, of the training environment for junior doctors. And we have that intelligence now in Scotland in a room in which we can then decide whether we need to act in concert or act individually. And that's an important safeguard. But it's a safeguard in respect, not just in terms of um, concerns and where boards may be um, having uh, difficulties in their service provision, but it's also increasingly an important part of sharing good practice. So that's why we published earlier this year the annual report of the Sharing Intelligence Group, which outlines good practice, but also is quite overt about the challenges. So there are a number of mechanisms, and the Scottish Patient Safety Programme is a great example of where we are actually sharing good practice and ensuring it's reliably implemented and spread across Scotland. But one of the challenges internationally is how we spread good practice consistently and reliably. There's no simple answer to it, but I think we're making good progress in Scotland. Rosemary, are you, uh, previously there's been some suggestion that there's some legislative barrier to sharing information. Is that anything that you can shed light on? If it's anonymised, can't be attributed to anybody personally, just general intelligence type information, then we're pretty much like others. There are some named organisations that under certain circumstances we can share specific information with, but as an ombudsman organisation, my own legislation has restrictions which I think are a barrier um, and I could share more, I think, about um, at an individual level about patient care from what we've seen from complaints than I'm currently able to do because of that. Can you maybe write to us with the detail of that? Absolutely, yes. We'd be very interested in that, I think, yeah. Okay, Ash, do you... you 
Any further? No. no. Okay, I wonder if I could ask in terms of accountability at, at board level. Um, <clears throat> some people feel that um, in terms of territorial boards that there's um, there's a bit of tokenism in terms of accountability. I had a look, uh, just for speed, I looked at NHS Lothian's um, board papers for the last couple of months. October, um, the board was presented with 307 pages. June, it was 568. And in April, it was 514 pages of information to board members to presumably scrutinise and sign off or, or interrogate. Um, is it realistic to believe that presenting a board with 568 pages, um, those pa those papers are going to get um, the scrutiny that they possibly deserve? During that, since it was our papers that you looked at then, um, <clears throat> I agree, it's an awful lot of uh, information to look at. I think it's important to see those board papers, though, in the context of the wider way that the board works. So where a governance committee is chaired by a non-executive, they have, as is set out in the submission, in fact, things that they're providing assurance against for the wider board. And so there's a system that feeds down from that. But there's also... Um, board development seminars, for example, where we might explore a topic in more detail that would allow the board paper to then be more of a highlight report. But the, the, the Clinical Governance Committee, Healthcare Governance, which I guess is the most pertinent committee uh, for this uh, discussion this morning, uh, receives a lot of papers. But actually, I, I, um, my experience of sitting around that table is that members of that committee do read all those papers and they're... I find that difficult to believe. Yeah. I seriously find that difficult to believe. Having sat on a local authority where we were presented with w massive amounts of paper, um, I know from experience that people do not, and I don't believe NHS loading is any different. So, or so, any other NHS board. Well, I was going to say, so I do know that sometimes my non-executive colleagues will ask quite detailed questions, or if things are there that are not in a section for discussion, they'll ask for that to be moved into a section for wider discussion. Um, so, so I can only go by my experience. You know, an average reader, if they were reading a 568-page novel, it would probably take them, you know, a week, you know, um, or so. Maybe I'm just a slow reader. But I just think that that is not, uh, you know, if we're looking for proper scrutiny and accountability, then presenting that kind of volume of stuff to an annual, uh, um, is it a monthly board meeting or a bi-monthly? So, so the board meeting is bi-monthly? Yeah. I just personally think that's not credible. So, so, so I do understand that it's a lot of information. So I think that is how we would tr try to, for example, where there are particular topics, to have a presentation on that topic, which then sometimes makes that easier to access for people. The reason I'm saying that is that if you have a, an issue that's a very difficult issue or that you want to go through the board without much controversy, it'd be very easy to hide them in 568 pages of documentation so that um, people would easily miss it, or statistics that might be thrown up a concern. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just sceptical. Jason, sorry. Well, let me that with, we're not trying to hide anything, Mr Finlay, and we're not trying to c cover up numbers that are contained within the board documents. I imagine, I haven't looked at those same pages that you have. I, I imagine those board papers are divided into items for discussion, which will be a smaller set, and items for whatever the noun might be in there for for voting for whatever. And and all of the member the board is the peak of that particular governance pyramid, and underneath that are the committee is the committee structure. So there's a committee of audit, there's a committee of clinical governance, and there's a, and they will I imagine send papers to the big board meeting that they have scrutinised previously. So the chair of the clinical governance committee will be around that boardroom table and will be able to very quickly say the governance committee looked at this and this is what we're doing. Uh, you have a good generic point and that is what should the board do? And it, I, I go around these board meetings and I often present at them or discuss with them. And boards in the last 10 years have matured significantly in the health system and increasingly in the IGB world into a world where the quality report, however you want to, however you want to describe it, is, is the bulk of that conversation now. There's a big conversation about finance inside that quality, efficiency, but there's also now a conversation about the quality of the delivery system inside that. And they're very, very robust conversations. I haven't been in a board where there isn't a robust conversation about the quality of the delivery system. 
in, in relation to uh, IGBs, maybe, uh, Sheena, you comment about lines of accountability there and how that operates. Very similar to the the, the uh, way that uh, uh, Professor Leach has identified. So again, there's um, a finance and audit committee, there's a performance scrutiny committee uh, as, uh, uh, that sits under the uh, integrated joint, joint board. Um, also, just in follow-up to your, your, your other point, I'm sure, again, others uh, will have done similar, but a number of development sessions with focused, in, uh, focused um, uh, reports and presentations on certain areas, particularly around finance, but particularly also about how that relates to uh, patient and uh, and service user care and the impact of uh, or the potential impact of any changes. So those development sessions, particularly in the earlier days of uh, the uh, IJB, have been particularly important so that um, uh, members, which is obviously non-execs non as well as uh, councillors, uh, elected members within the within the city have had the have had the chance to get information on perhaps slightly more informal type of presentation uh, and encouraged to ask uh, obviously and supported to ask ask questions and um, and therefore have a better sense of the field of operation um, but particular emphasis on the impact of decision making on patient service user care service uh, service delivery Nick, did you want to yeah, thanks very much. I, I, I'm not going to argue with the point that uh, you know a 500-page document is not a reliable single way to uh, transmit information or to run accountability. And I think what everyone's describing is that there are multiple layers of approach. Um, and we've heard some of them, which is about tiered governance systems, which start from sort of ward level all the way up to the board, involvement of non-execs in other types of sort of activity. Um, for us, you know, s some of the additional things is that we we've done quite a lot of work really about how do we present and interrogate data. So uh, development stuff with the board about how to actually look at data and ask the right questions. We do stuff in terms of understanding our systems and processes for the board. And thirdly, which I think is most important, is actually getting the board members to meet the teams that are involved in this. Because I think when you put together that sort of review of information and understanding a system and process, and you meet the people that are involved in delivering that, then you get a much better idea about whether you can be assured that what you're seeing or what assurance you're getting is valid or not. Emma, did you want to come in? Just a quick point about um, near misses and significant adverse event reporting across the IGBs, because we're focusing on boards, but health and social care integration is major now for us. So I'm assuming that we've got the correct or the same processes uh, that we follow for the IGBs as far as SAEs or near misses. You based, sorry if that directed to me, um, the, uh, you've got uh, processes which are compatible, uh, complementary maybe, but, but not exactly the same. So you have got exactly the same process within the health uh, element of the, of the uh, health and social care partnership, and you have uh, critical incident reviews, significant incident reviews and processes within the council and social care element of the uh, partnership. What we've worked really hard to do, and particularly in my role, has been to try and bring those together uh, to make sure that we're following one overarching policy and to make sure as well that where a patient or service user um, is in receipt in a, of a range of services and we've particularly looked at uh, multiple and complex needs so for example uh, individuals who are receiving addiction mental health criminal justice uh, potentially services through homelessness that we are looking across the way at the at the issues that have impacted on whatever the uh, whatever the events has, event has been uh, we've taken a lot of learning from uh, from mental health uh, particularly in relation to um, the emphasis <coughs> on, again, some of the points that have been made before, openness, involvement of the family wherever possible, um, and, and certainly being really clear if there's not involvement of the family, in both in the process of the investiga in investigation and the, pro and the feedback loop. And then that bit around making sure that staff uh, have the opportunity to learn from those events and learn through, as I've indicated, dissemination in, in whatever the appropriate forum forum is. So um, 
one of the issues for the uh, uh, IJB, certainly in, 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 in Glasgow and from the Health and Social Care Partnership, is about uh, making sure that you are not, as far as possible, not duplicating effort, um, but also not allowing anything to slip potentially between uh, two stools. And that's that, that complexity of health, social care, relationship between the IJB and the health board and in a Glasgow context, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, six local authorities, a number of services that have responsibility across, uh, that, that um, uh, have cross-cutting influence on all of those. So it is about trying to pull all of that, all of that together. In the last five minutes, so we'll need to be absolute rapid fire here, um, and I've got quite a number of people still want to come in. So, Miles. Thank you, Camina. I wanted to um, return to culture, and it follows on from a point you said, because a lot of the evidence um, which we've taken um, from people has actually been about two things. P firstly, from people who work in the health service, the fact that they now feel that they have a culture-driven, a, a, a culture in the NHS which is just target-driven, and they're being forced to try to work towards that. And secondly, for families, um, families not being included and actively excluded. And we've met with a lot of people who've felt that, especially within CAMS and mental health. So I just wondered, around the table, um, for people taking decisions, what they felt actually, the fact we've received that as evidence, how they feel the health services. Um, do you want to... Issues around, the whole issue around the culture within the NHS has been a recurring theme in this, about people saying that there's a negative, a kind of blame culture within it, people afraid to report uh, issues or feel that nothing happens when they do and that they feel intimidated by that. We've had that from uh, middle managers and we've had it from people working on the uh, front line. Uh, thank you. The, uh, I'm not sure if it is exactly a response, um, but there is the thought process which uh, Don Burr uses from IHI, um, talking about three eras of medicine. Uh, the first era being the, the we know best, the paternalist. Uh, the second era, which we are probably in now, which is about measurement um, and, and, and standards <coughs> and, and, and everything, anything that can be counted is counted, and what you count counts. Um, um, moving on to a professionalism and more uh, moral era. And that, I think, is the change which is being described by many people. Um, I think it is absolutely correct that the involvement of families um, has not been as good as it should be. And we have picked that up. And there is change ongoing. So I'm involved in a significant adverse event review at the moment. And it starts off with the question to the family, what is it that you would like answered? That creates, as Tracy pointed out, um, a powerful, check, powerful question. But actually, we found other things as well that we needed to go through. So it's not all of it, but it's really important. And in terms of a report back to the family, that is specifically done um, with the offer of meeting. So it is changing. Jason? I, I By some of what uh, Mr. Briggs describes, I think we are on a, uh, a little bit of an evolution within Western healthcare to be more inclusive of patients and families and carers. And we've tried to do that in Scotland. And if you read the Nuffield Trust report, it would suggest that other countries should come to Scotland to see some of that. It, it's not perfect, and there is still lots to do. The realistic medicine, the CMO's realistic medicine report, talks a lot about shared decision making, about making those decisions with families. And that goes right back to the beginning of our conversation about the individualization of care. The What Matters to You work is uh, globally leading about conversations from education services through care homes, through hospices, and, and primary and secondary care about how you would involve patients and families. Uh, Sir Harry's report on targets and indicators last week helps us move the conversation on a little about that target-driven culture, how we might change that for frontline teams in particular. And, some of the scrutiny, though, some of the accountability that we've discussed seeks <coughs> numbers, seeks targets and indicators. So we've got to get that balance right. I think, I think we have in this conversation. We've, we've had a, a good conversation about where that balance lies. But, but we have to release that front line, that, the, the teams who are actually seeing the patients and families, to, to do as much of that work as we can and yet still hold the system accountable for it. Are we doing that then? So I... Because at the moment, we are, what we are hearing is about, you know, staff under huge pressure because there are not enough of them. They need resources. 
and because of that pressure, they are finding it difficult to, um, for example, nurses do their CPD. They are finding it difficult when they do make suggestions to improve things. That that is being stifled by, you know, a t from a top. So how do we change all that culture? There are times when that's true, but there are other times when that isn't true. I had a I had a trip to NHS Grampian a couple of weeks ago where I went to a number of teams, and I don't think they just took me to the nice people. But they took me to a number of teams where they were empowered, where they had chosen to improve things, where they had had learning inside the environment. I met the junior doctors in the evening for pizza and asked them wh what it was like inside that environment. It was, of course, not all perfect. Of course, there was opportunity for things to get better. But in the main, they were very, very happy with the environment in which they were working. They, they understood the resource constraint, the staffing, the, of course. But they also talked about the reduction in infections, the fact they hadn't ever seen a central line infection, they hadn't seen a case of C. difficile because they were gone, and, and the nature of the culture in which they were working in, in NHS Grampian. Did the same in Highland the following week. It felt very similar. Lots of work on clinical efficiency. Lots of now, we need to make sure that applies universally across the 160,000 staff as much as we possibly can. And we've touched today on how we might get a balance, Healthcare Improvement Scotland's work, the board's work on, on trying, trying to do that. But don't leave with the impression I think it's fixed or perfect. I, I, I don't. I spend my days trying to make it better. People today. Um, who uh, was next? Colin. Colin. Can we know that the, the issue was on um, integration, so I think it's been covered. Oh, okay. Um, Sandra? just wanted to ask about patient involvement. Uh, obviously, we know that, um, I'm not saying your hands are tied, uh, but basically you don't have any legislative power over health boards uh, in, in that respect. And, you know, lots of people have said that uh, they feel as though it's a tick box exercise when they're changing services. And if I could give an example in my own constituency, uh, minor injuries unit, where it's based in Partick, Part it was the only place it wasn't asked to, to consultation, and it was the people themselves who pushed to get that <coughs> consultation in the area where they're going to remove that service. Uh, so I just wondered, do you do you agree with the people when they say it's a tick box exercise, or is there something we can do to improve the fact that if it's not a tick box exercise, how do you convince the, the people out there who are using it that they, they generally are consultation exercises if they're changing services? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, 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 it's a very important point, and indeed an evidence I've given to this committee uh, in previous uh, attendances is the importance of the quality of the engagement from the very start, as opposed to it being presented as a done deal down the track. And I think one of the, the key things for, for me is we start to think about every bit of service engagement and redesign, not just the bits which are controversial at the major cut-off threshold, and that's really important in the context of the future work for me of the Scottish Health Council in that quality assurance that there is genuine and meaningful engagement in uh, the redesign of services. If I could just pick up the point that Mr Briggs made um, earlier about child and adolescent mental health services, absolutely crucial about children and adolescents, but their families being supported. They're not just informal carers, as one of my colleagues said to me the other day, they're actually intensive carers for those individuals. And today we're at an event for child and adolescent mental health services, which would be an opportunity for these families and patients uh, and carers to be involved in the design of CAM services in the future. So I think we're on a journey, but um, I recognise the points. I was going to be speaking at that this morning, but you trumped it. There you go. Uh, OK, um, we really are pushing our time. We've got the Minister coming in for uh, a piece of work. Um, could I just ask a couple of very quick final things that we haven't covered? Um, and if you can answer very briefly, on why some service standards are monitored and others aren't. Um, do you like, wish to answer? Yep, Robbie. So we have um, older people standards monitored um, regularly through the programme of inspection. We have HEI and standards monitored. Um, there's a matter of prioritisation, convener. There's also an issue in terms of some of the standards are out of date, so it's an ongoing programme of refresh as well. Prioritisation? Because so for the patient, they would obviously want to ensure that they're being treated absolutely. to the highest yep. standards, but who, who then prioritises? So there's a prioritisation process involving patients, clinicians in, in that design, but also there's a, an, an issue of ensuring that those standards are up to date and making sure that they're relevant. So, for instance, the work we've been doing in the national screening programmes that were um, reviewing breast screening standards because 
technology has moved on. The environment for breast screening services has changed quite considerably over the past five or six years. So there's a process here of prioritisation. But I'm not quite sure then. So who, you know, in, in another field, who, who would then make the decision that that's not a priority? So it's not a priority about what's the standard. It's actually a priority about um, how we actually deploy our resources. So we made a commitment that in terms of the the three million pounds that we spend on scrutiny, that we should be actually investing time in inspecting quality, assuring the dignity and respect afforded to older people in our hospitals. So that's why we have a very comprehensive inspection programme for older people. And indeed, in the context of the veil of leaving, that, that's why we have a very comprehensive and rigorous inspection programme for HAI. Two final things I won't ask. I'll just put it on the record. If people can um, maybe provide us with information <laughs> afterwards, is the issue around CPD that Alison raised about how we ensure that um, you know under staff pressure staff are getting the opportunity um, to ensure their practice is kept up to speed. And we've heard evidence that that's not the case. And the final thing is about um, how we ensure dignity and respect is absolutely um, built into the system. So if maybe people could follow up information after and send that to the clerk and team, that would be really helpful. We are really pushed for time. So thank you very much, um, um, and we'll suspend briefly. Agenda item three is subordinate legislation. Uh, we have one affirmative instrument to consider. As usual with affirmative instruments, we uh, have an evidence session uh, with the Minister and the officials on the instrument. Um, the instrument we're looking at today is the Public Bodies Joint Working Prescribed Local Authority Functions, etc. Scotland Amendment Number 2, Regulations 2017 Draft. Can I welcome to the meeting Aileen Campbell, Minister for Public Health and Sport, uh, Peter Stapleton, Carers Policy, Brian Nisbet, Head uh, Health and Social Care Integration, and Ruth uh, Linney, Lawyer, All Scottish uh, Government. Can I have a brief opening statement, Minister? Thank you, Convener, and thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, briefly to the committee about, oh, sorry, is that you? In stereo, Neil. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
yeah, thank you again then to, for the opportunity to speak uh, to the committee about these amending regulations. You'll all be aware that when this Parliament passed the Carers Scotland Act 2016 in February of last year, the integration of health and social care was already underway across Scotland. As the Joint Committee will recall, the um, the pu purpose of the Public Bodies Joint Working Prescribed Local Authority Functions Regulations 2014 is to provide for the mandatory delegation of adult social care functions to integration authorities so that these functions must form part of their strategic commissioning plan for delivering health and social care services locally. We've put forward this instrument to further amend the principal regulations so that they take account of the provisions in the Carers Scotland Act in the same way. If approved, this instrument will remove Section 3 of the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Act 2013 from the schedule of the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014, as the provision is repealed by the Carers Scotland Act 2016 when it fully comes into force on the 1st of April uh, next year. In addition, this instrument will prescribe the functions conferred on a local authority under Section 6, 24, 25, 31, 34 and 35 of the Carers Act as ones which must be delegated to integration authorities. These sections of the Carers Act cover a range of local authority functions in relation to carers. Section 6, for, for example, will require integration authorities to offer and prepare an adult carer support plan for identified adult carers. Section 31 will require that they prepare a local carer strategy, which will outline how carers will be identified and supported in their local communities. It's important to note that, in line with existing integration legislation, the requirement to delegate these functions only applies so far as they are exercisable in relation to adult social care. Delegation of these functions in the context of children's social care remains a matter for local decision. I won't detail for the committee all the functions under the Carers Act that must be delegated as, as they're laid out within the supporting policy note for these regs, but I would like to emphasise that the prescription of these functions will ensure that there is legislative synergy between the carers and public uh, bodies' legal frameworks and allow functions which stem from the Carers Act to be carried out within an integrated health and social care context. Supporting these changes will allow integration authorities to continue with their strategic planning and commissioning priorities and it will ensure objectives to improve outcomes for carers which we as a parliament put in place when we supported the passage of the 2016 Act can be taken forward as an integral aspect of the integration of health and social care. So uh, uh, thank you again, uh, com uh, convener, for allowing us to give evidence and happy to take any questions you have on the regulations. Okay, any questions from any of the members? No. Okay. Uh, if that's the case, we then move on to the next agenda item, which is the formal debate on the affirmative SSI in which we've just taken evidence. Uh, could I remind the committee and others that members should not put questions to the Minister during formal debates and officials may not speak in the debate. Uh, can I invite the Minister to move the motion? Formally moved. Thank you. Any contributions uh, from members? Nope. I'm assuming you do not want to sum up, Minister. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, we'll pass on that. Okay, Kindle. thank you. <laughs> uh, so, the question is that motion S5M09005 uh, be approved. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll suspend to allow, allow the Minister to leave.
The fifth, fifth item on our agenda is uh, further subordinate legislation. We have uh, one negative instrument to consider. Uh, the instrument is the Public Bodies Joint Working Prescribed Health Board's Function Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017. Uh, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, is there any comments from members? No. Then that is agreed. Thank you very much. And at the previous meeting, uh, we agreed that we would now go into private session.